the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. It's often said that history is written through the eyes of the winners. When we look at maps of the world, we often don't see territory conquered from one group as belonging to its previous owners, as much as part of the winning side's gains. But throughout the world, indigenous people are fighting for the right to reclaim land they lost due to European territorial expansion, colonialism, or to other means. One place where this debate has been ongoing is Australia. There, Aborigines and other indigenous people have fought for years to advance their native land claims, with resistance from the government and mining and energy companies. One milestone came last year when Australia's Woodside Petroleum dropped plans to build a massive $45 billion natural gas processing facility on the coast of northwestern Australia. That case had split members of the region's Gularbulu Aborigines between those who wanted to protect pristine lands worshipped by the elders and those who wanted to accept the $1.5 billion payout offered by the energy companies. This week on Global Journalist, we'll talk about some other land disputes between Aborigines and Australia's federal and provincial governments. The first of these comes from Australia's remote and arid Northern Territory, an area about twice the size of Texas and home to 230,000 people. There at a place called Mukati Station, about 800 kilometers south of the city of Darwin, the Australian government had plans to build a nuclear waste dump on Aboriginal land to hold the country's radioactive waste. The indigenous people were divided about the plan, but after a seven-year battle, opponents of the dump scored a victory earlier this year when the Australian government withdrew the plan. Recently, another Aboriginal clan near Mukati has offered the Australian government a new tract of land for the nuclear waste dump. Here to talk to us about the controversy around Australia's plan to build a dump for radioactive waste on Aboriginal land is Natalie Wosley of the Beyond Nuclear Initiative. The group advocates for Aboriginal peoples and nuclear disputes in Australia. She joins us from Alice Springs in Australia's Northern Territory. Natalie, welcome to Global Journalist. Thank you very much, Jason. If you could just give us a layman's overview of the Australian government's efforts to build a nuclear waste dump on Aboriginal land in the Northern Territory. Well, for about 20 years now, the federal government or successive federal governments have been trying to locate a national radioactive waste facility in Australia. And they've uh, targeted Aboriginal land firstly in South Australia and then in the Northern Territory. It's the real mentality of the desert being out of mind, out of sight as a sacrifice and dumping zone. There's been no scientific rationale for this. It's only ever been a political decision to get that waste out of mind and out of sight. But as they fought in South Australia, the community in the Northern Territory also fought and as you explained earlier, won that battle against the government. I wanted to ask you Outsiders are going to look at this and they'll say the Northern Territory is this vast region, something like 1.4 million square kilometers. The nuclear waste dump that's being proposed is one square kil kilometer. Uh, you know, and for Americans, this area has a population density about one tenth that of Alaska. It's arid. Some people might say if we've got to have a nuclear waste dump, this might not be a bad place to have it. Well, firstly, that's never been proven that we do need a single remote nuclear waste facility in Australia. Actually, the majority of the nuclear expertise is concentrated around the one nuclear reactor that we have operating in Australia. This isn't a nuclear power reactor, so we do generate a much smaller amount of waste in comparison to the United States and other nuclear-powered countries. So, actually, what would be the best for now is for that waste to be stored where it is produced. There's grave transport risks taking this waste, about 3,500 kilometres which was the proposal. And in the Northern Territory, we've seen a series of transport accidents, including the train falling off the rails, many heavy truck accidents and incidents. So, you know, it hasn't been proven that we need it in a remote area where there's no scientific expertise. Actually, what it is, it's targeting people in impoverished communities to take Australia's most toxic industrial waste. Tell us, if you would, about the role of the Aboriginal land councils in all of this, because as I understand it, the Aboriginal land councils themselves have in some cases nominated tracts of land uh, for the nuclear waste dump. Well, the Northern Territory has probably the strongest Aboriginal land rights regime in Australia, and the Muckety Aboriginal Land Trust is designated Aboriginal land under the Lab Aboriginal Land Rights Act. So, theoretically, the traditional owners should have say over what happens on that land. 
The actual business of that land is administered by a land council in the Muckety area that was the Northern Land Council. And what we saw was actually a nomination of a small part of Muckety offered by the Northern Land Council, even though there was very clear contest from even before the actual site was picked from the majority of traditional owners who have responsibilities in that area. What, what is the government offering the people in the area in return for having a nuclear waste dump in their backyard? Originally, the government was offering a $12 million compensation package, and that would be just a one-off payment. So really, if you look at the facility that was proposed, it would be a three to 400 year or longer facility, and there wouldn't be much um, really opportunities for people to be working there. The government said probably 30 construction jobs and six security guards on rotation. So looking at a facility over that many years with the funding divided by a number of people and during the federal court proceedings, we actually found out that the money wouldn't be distributed to traditional owners. It would be held in the charitable trust fund, which would be then used for things like roads and housing and essential infrastructure and also education scholarships. So it's really dangling a big carrot to say to people in quite remote and impoverished areas, that you need to have a, a very high impact long-term facility to get the basic rights and services that people in cities get anyway. Aboriginal people in Australia have significantly higher rates of poverty, unemployment, alcoholism than the general public. In many cases these groups don't have a lot of resources. What are some of the concerns about how the Australian government has dealt with them in these discussions? Is there concern that the government isn't giving them the full picture about the risks of having a radioactive waste dump nearby? Well, to address the first part of that question, we've seen a systematic stripping back of resources to remote Aboriginal communities from both the Territory and the Federal Government. And that's been policy after policy coming in and denying people the opportunity to have funding to upgrade housing, to upgrade roads and to provide services such as health clinics and schools. And there was actually a concerted effort to move people into what they called hub towns. So they'd concentrate populations of people into the larger service centres um, on the premise then they wouldn't have to be providing services to remote areas but really that's just concentrating problems because there wasn't a, um, the push to build as much housing as would be required in those areas if you're moving people in and already there's chronic overcrowding you know in some remote communities there's up to 30 people living in houses and so you know it's it's really what we've seen is a big push to move people in at the same time the legislation says that once traditional owners have nominated and you know it's presented as being a volunteer nomination any other land around the nominated area can then be acquired for the facility and the government effectively extinguishes all rights of traditional owners to that land. So once you've signed, you're giving away land and effectively it may never be returned and it may be contaminated. And, you know, are, have there been some concerns about sort of the amount of information that the government has been sharing with the, the local can, land councils, with the local people? In the recent round of discussion, the government has actually come out and met with different groups of traditional owners, trying again to entice people to nominate for the facility since the Muckety plan was overturned. And one common theme throughout these consultations was the government refusing to even name what the compensation package would be in exchange for the dump. So they were expecting people to make a nomination without knowing what the entitlements would be in exchange, and also again not clearly explaining the full terms of that facility because they haven't done a site design yet, so we don't actually know what it's going to look like out on country. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On this week's program, we are talking about Indigenous land disputes in Australia. Right now, we're discussing the Australian government's efforts to build a nuclear waste dump on Aboriginal land in the country's remote Northern Territory. We are joined from Alice Springs in Australia's Northern Territory by Natalie Wosley of the Beyond Nuclear Initiative, which advocates for Aboriginal people in disputes with Australia's nuclear industry. For more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues, and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, at Global Journ. Natalie, I wanted to ask you as well, what is it that the Aboriginal people are looking for in these discussions? Are, is there a certain price tag or a certain number that would be acceptable for citing a nuclear waste dump around Muckety? Or is it that 
people just don't want the radioactive waste there, period. Well, in every area that's been proposed, so firstly South Australia, the three original sites proposed in the Northern Territory and then Muckety, people were very clear that you can't put a value on that land to sell it for a nuclear waste dump. What's more important to the traditional owners and the local community is having access to the land and it not being fenced off and to not have a, a highly toxic, long-lived industrial waste stored on that country, which would effectively change it forever. The low-level waste is proposed to be buried and that would never be dug up. So essentially for people with strong cultural connections to that land, that would be broken. And people have been clear to say there's no money value you can put on that. Now since the withdrawal of the earlier plan around Muckety, I understand there has been a, another Aboriginal land council that has come forward with a proffer of land. What, what's going to happen next in this issue? What do you see for the future? Well, surprisingly, the Northern Land Council is talking again about preparing to nominate another site on Muckety and traditional owners straight away said that they will be campaigning as long and as hard as they did last time and people really dedicated almost a decade to this campaign. They travelled tirelessly around the country, they communicated and developed relationships with trade unions, public health organisations, students, local pastoralists. They really built a strong network of support and that's going to transfer to any site in the region or indeed across the country because the Muckety traditional owners are now linked into a very solid network of people campaigning not only against the environmental problems a national radioactive waste facility would cause in a remote area but the obvious human rights abuses that have come with this top-down approach. Natalie Wasley of the Beyond Nuclear Initiative in Alice Springs, Australia. Thanks for joining us. Thank we you, turn now, We turn now to New South Wales in southeastern Australia. There, another dispute between Aboriginal people and the regional government of New South Wales has been making headlines in the country. At issue is a long-standing effort by an Aboriginal group to claim a tract of coastal land, an effort the provincial government fought in court for 20 years before the case was recently decided in favour of the Aboriginal group. That led to an effort by the New South Wales government to quash all additional claims to coastal lands by Aborigines and other Indigenous groups leading hundreds of Aborigines to protest in Sydney earlier this month. To talk about the effort by Aboriginal and Indigenous people to claim access to coastal land in New South Wales is Chris Spencer, the CEO of the Coffs Harbour and District Local Aboriginal Land Council. He joins us from Coffs Harbour, about 340 miles north of Sydney. Chris, welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for having me, Jason. Thanks again for joining us. You're the head of the land council that represents the Aboriginal people around Coffs Harbour. Tell us about the genesis of this dispute and the effort to claim this, as I understand it, four kilometres of coastline in New South Wales. Why was it so important to members of your group? Uh, the, the property in question here, Jason, is the traditional homelands of the Garby Elders Group. and. Um, in 1993, um, members of the Garby Elders Group, along with members of the Coffs Harbour and District Local Aboriginal Land Council, made aware of a tract of land that was available for a claim under the definitions of our legislation. That claim was lodged in, in 1993, and it was subsequently refused by the New South Wales State Government in 2009. At that point, we uh, contested that in the Land and Environment Court, and the Land and Environment Court ruled in our favour in December of 2013, meaning that um, the Aboriginal community of Coffs Harbour now owns the, the vast tract of land being 3.7 kilometres between the townships of Red Rock and Corindai Beach on the New South Wales north coast. And as I understand it, this was something of a groundbreaking case in Australia and New South Wales because previously Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, had not been able to claim land on Australia's coast. That's correct, Jason. Uh, to my knowledge, this particular land claim that was successful is the only land claim for an Aboriginal land council in New South Wales that actually is bounded by the mean high water mark to the east. Um, but in saying that, the New South Wales government failed to indicate to, to the parliament that there were caveats and easements created in the Land Environment Court ruling, which specifically and categorically says that 
a 30 metre easement is created for the access of the public for recreation um, activities, which when it was released, the bill by the government um, didn't actually indicate that there was still going to be public access to the beach. Um, the way that it was introduced was sort of indicating that we as an Aboriginal community were going to stop the general public from using the beach, which is, which is not the case. And so the Aboriginal community will own the land behind the beach uh, on this 3.7 kilometre stretch of land, but the general public will still have access to the beach then, is that correct? That's correct, Jason. Uh, now, one thing I wanted to ask you about as well, um, well, let me, if I could, if I could just back you up for a moment here. You had said that this land had some particular significance or importance to the Aboriginal group around Coffs Harbour. How is that, how do you intend to use that land? So this land is a, a, a stretch of land that's what we call pretty much untouched. So it hasn't been, hasn't been utilised by European settlements and urban expansion and so forth. So in saying that, our, our ancestors um, prior to European settlement in New South Wales would utilise that area um, for different types of activities, including camping. Um, I know that past elders have been born in that particular area as well, and it contains culturally significant areas known to, to our community as Hogan's Hole and Washaway. Now, let me ask you about sort of the significance of this case, because as I understand in the New South Wales Parliament, following the decision by the courts granting this land to the Aboriginal Council, there was an effort to quash about 1,800 other coastal land claims by Aborigines in New South Wales. What, what was the response within your community to that effort? So in, in the introduction of that bill, if the bill was passed through Parliament, it, it actually meant that retrospectively it would extinguish up to 600 kilometres or 1,800 Aboriginal land claims in New South Wales. As, as a, a network and as Aboriginal communities, we were very upset that that was going to occur and hence the reason why uh, between four and 500 Aboriginal people went to Sydney on the 3rd of November this year and um, protested the Parliament to actually extinguish that bill. However, the bill has now been shelved, which just means that it's been put on hold pending further consultation with the Aboriginal Land Rights Network of New South Wales. Tell our listeners, if you would, many people in the United States and elsewhere won't be familiar. When Aboriginal people are trying to make a claim to a parcel of land in Australia, what sort of evidence do they need to pre present in court to demonstrate that the land should be theirs? Well, our act is very specific. So the legislation says, Jason, that um, we are not able to claim lands unless there are available crown land not designated for essential public purpose. So that means that there are uh, different parcels of land throughout our locality that actually have that crown gazettal, meaning that it's invested in the crown, and, and through that process we're able to lodge claims over that land. Um, from time to time that land may be needed for essential public purpose um, through the sporting fields and community centres and those sorts of things, for example, and uh, we're completely aware and mindful that those things need to happen and therefore some of our claims aren't able to be granted. Now, well, when the Aboriginal groups come to court, you need to show simply that you had ancestors that lived or utilised on the land or do you need to show that uh, it is being actively used by Aboriginal groups uh, in the present day? Not, not necessarily, no. Um, as I just indicated, the, the land claim system in New South Wales is actually prescriptive around certain classes of land and only those classes of land that are vested in the Crown estate. So we can't go and claim, uh, oh, I suppose, hospitals and, and those sorts of places because they're needed for essential public purpose and they're, even though they're on their Crown estate. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On this week's program, we are talking about a couple of different land disputes between Australia's Aboriginal peoples 
and its federal and regional governments. We're joined from Coffs Harbour, Australia, by Chris Spencer, the CEO of the Coffs Harbour and District Local Aboriginal Land Council, and from Alice Springs in Australia's Northern Territory by Natalie Wosley of the Beyond Nuclear Initiative, which advocates for Aboriginal people in disputes with Australia's nuclear industry. For more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues, and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Chris Spencer of the Coffs Harbor District Local Aboriginal Land Council. Some people are going to look at these claims and say, it looks like some of these Aboriginal groups are try trying to claim access to coastal land because land along the beach is valuable and can be profitably developed for housing or tourism. You know, is that, is that the intention of some of the people making Aboriginal land claims to, to waterfront property in New South Wales? No, not necessarily, Jason. The, the, the main priority for our communities is the, the claiming of land may, gives us the power and the abilities to be able to teach our young future generations about the cultural landscapes and the different cultural activities that used to occur in those particular locations. Being coastal people, the land and the sea plays a significant role in, in the makeup of our identity. So without these parcels of land, it becomes extremely difficult to be able to reconnect some of our youth um, with, with our country. The other part of that, though, also is that um, a lot of the, the lands that are granted to local Aboriginal land councils cannot have any buildings and so forth um, put on them because they're actually within what are known in Australia as endangered ecological communities. So com communities of, of different plants that are actually in jeopardy of becoming extinct. Therefore, it's very difficult for any types of developments to occur in those particular areas. And if there was land problem. outside that's one of these endangered problem. ecological areas, is that land where there could be commercial development or residential development? No, no. It's, it's very prescriptive, the, the local government legislations that pertain to um, the different types of developments that can occur. And, and these particular lands are excluded through local development control plans and local environmental plans. So it's all about the, the natural landscape for us and making sure that that natural landscape and its integrity is remaining and intact so that future generations can prosper from the knowledge that's created from those areas. Now, after there had been this large demonstration in Sydney by Aborigines against this bill that was proposed in the New South Wales Parliament that would have essentially stripped uh, Aboriginal people of any future claims to coastal land, uh, after that bill was withdrawn, do you see that, that 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 was a temporary move that we're likely to see further restrictions on Aboriginal land claims in New South Wales down the road? Where do you see this issue going? Yes, this is an issue is alive and well for, for Aboriginal people in New South Wales. Um, there are a number of pieces of amendment bills that are up at the moment that pertain to our ability to claim land through the Crown Lands legislation which is very concerning for our communities. Our past ancestors who, who were part of the land rights system have fought tooth and nail to get our Land Rights Act to where it is today and also to be able to create opportunities for us to claim back land through a compensatory measure being the Land Rights Act. Um, without that ability, Aboriginal communities haven't got the ability to be able to provide adequate housing, different types of social programs and support, education and health. Um, they're the key things that we as Aboriginal people need and should be entitled to just the same as mainstream Australia. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On this week's program, we are talking about a couple of different land disputes between Australia's Aboriginal peoples and its federal and regional governments. We're joined from Coffs Harbour, Australia, by Chris Spencer, the CEO of the Coffs Harbour and District Local Aboriginal Land Council, and from Alice Springs, in Australia's Northern Territory by Natalie Wosley of the Beyond Nuclear Initiative, which advocates for Aboriginal people in disputes with Australia's nuclear industry. For more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. 
There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Natalie Wosley of the Beyond Nuclear Initiative, I want to turn the conversation back to you again. You'd mentioned earlier in our show with regards to the effort to site uh, a nuclear waste dump on Aboriginal land in the Northern Territory that the government's efforts over the past two decades to site a radioactive waste facility in Australia have time and again been focused on Aboriginal lands. Why do you think that is? Well, it really is uh, picking an impoverished community. They think they can throw breadcrumbs at, essentially, and get people to sign off for this toxic deal. You know, what we're looking at now is the federal government moving into a national site selection process where they may open it up to different landholders, including pastoralists. But we have to remember that that is Aboriginal land too, and quite often the pastoral industry has locked the gate on Aboriginal people. And so while a pastoralist may nominate a site, that's land that then Aboriginal people will be dispossessed from again. So really we're trying to shift the focus away from looking at single remote sites towards a national commission of inquiry that looks at all options because we're not convinced that we need a single remote site but what is important is to bring all stakeholders to the table because internationally you know the decide announce defend type model that real top-down approach just isn't working and countries really are starting to come around and say you need to have inclusive and transparent processes that include all stakeholders including local local Aboriginal land councils, local councils, scientific experts and community members. I wanted to ask you as well, there have been a number of reports that Australia was considering building a uh, international radioactive waste dump that would accept nuclear waste from elsewhere in the world, if you will. What's, what's your take on that? Is that something that's even remotely possible? How would that affect the Aboriginal communities that seem to be targeted uh, uh, with these? Well, it's no secret that the global nuclear industry has its sights set on Australia for an international nuclear waste facility. A former Prime Minister has been advocating it, and the current Chief Minister of the Northern Territory has also been quite explicit in saying that he would support establishment of an international nuclear waste dump here. So there is concern that if a national facility is up and running, that that's what we call the thin edge of the yellow cake wedge, and that that would then be expanded to be an international facility. So while a national facility is dangerous in itself, we do have concerns that there is an ongoing push for an international facility in Australia. That's all for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Chris Spencer and Natalie Wosley for joining us. Global Journalist executive producer is Casey Morrell. This week's lead producer is Taylor DeHayes, with production assistance from Pablo Gabilondo, Mary Ryan, and Laura Welfringer. Our technical director is Travis McMillan from RJI. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us this week. We hope you'll be with us next time.